Hi, Bookmatic Lifelong Learners. We've got a great guest today, Ryan Britt, the author of Phasers on Stun. Thank you so much for joining us, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Matt. I'm very excited to chat. Yeah, so uh, I noticed that you write a lot about sci-fi. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what sure, you Sure, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, as you say, I'm the author of the book Phasers on Stun, How the Making and Remaking of Star Trek Changed the World. Uh, which came out last year in 2022, May of 2022. So it's almost been out for a year. Um, wow. But I uh, I write about a lot of other science fiction, uh, uh, journalism, essays, things like that. I'm actually wearing a Star Wars shirt today. I'm kind of, I'm I'm wearing a rival rival group, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but we as we're but, <laughs> but as we're recording this, it is Star Wars celebration in. Um, in in london so i think that it's okay that i'm wearing a star wars shirt today yeah, um <laughs> plus plus as i say in my book uh george lucas credited star trek with being the sort of foundation for star wars to be able to be a mainstream phenomenon mm -hmm. and in terms of mainstreaming pop science fiction um and taking like the literary science fiction tropes from books and magazines into the mainstream star trek is really the bridge uh, uh, to uh, all the other things that we enjoy now, you know, um, you know, Kevin Feig of the uh, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is like a big mm -hmm. Star Trek: The Next Generation fan, and you know, uh, references the Star Trek films and the in the Avengers films, you know. So there's a lot of Star Trek is kind of like, in my opinion, without Star Trek, you don't have all these other franchises. So they're all kind of you know, uh, dependent on each other. But yeah, I am a nonfiction writer. I guess I would consider myself. A pop culture uh, uh, journalist uh, and and critic yeah. with a focus on science fiction. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, for sure. Uh, yeah, so my first book was in 2015, which was an essay collection called "Luke Skywalker Can't Read," which was kind of a humorous uh, survey of different science fiction franchises that I'm interested in. And then "Phasers on Stun" is the Star Trek history book that came out last year. And then at the end of this year, 2023, in September. On September 26th, I have another book coming out, all with uh, Plume, Penguin, Random House, um, all three of these books, um, mm -hmm. called The Spice Must Flow, which is a book about the history of Dune. Um, yeah, I'm so, so pumped yeah. up about that, right? Yeah, yeah. You yeah, can yeah. probably yeah. see the books in the background there, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got, yeah, yeah, you've got, yeah, the, yeah. I've got the yeah. whole series, so I'm pumped up about that book, too. And yeah. when I saw Phasers on Stun, I have an Audible account. Usually I read physical books, but I ended up picking up your book on Audible, and cool. I just thoroughly enjoyed listening to this book on the way to work every single day about a half an hour to an hour every day listening to your book and uh i just absolutely loved the detail that you get into um and uh also your personal insights your personal opinions like you mentioned your daughter a few times i can totally yeah. connect with that because i've got a daughter as well and yeah uh, you know and i'm sure a lot of the listeners out there could probably connect with that as well so uh that's amazing like what uh like how did you get introduced to star trek as a as a child and like what sort of impact did it have on you Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because, um, you know, I don't know when this will go out, but, um, you know, as we're recording this, Star Trek Picard season three is airing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, nostalgia for 80s and 90s uh, kids, you know, people like, are you know, kind of yeah. grew up in the 80s or 90s. Um, so I was aware of the original series when I was a child. Um, very much so and a huge fan of the original series, but... I was, you know, six turning seven when The Next Generation debuted in 1987. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that was a big deal. You know what I mean? For me, that was a huge bit. And, you know, I kind of became, I had watched the original series a little bit with my dad when I was young. But, you know, five, you kind of, your memories are a little hazy. Mm -hmm. But my memories of becoming a Star Trek fan were becoming a fan of the original series while The Next Generation is becoming a worldwide phenomenon. And a worldwide phenomenon that was statistically uh, much bigger than the original series ever had been. You know what I mean? By 1994, I think I say this in the book, you know, you have 20 million people watching the next, a syndicated show, you know, The Next Generation. It was the highest, it was 
the the nineties were easily the time that Star Trek was the most popular. You know what I mean? Like in terms yeah. of ways, in terms of metrics that we know, <laughs> it's tough mm-hmm. to measure these things now with streaming TV because the um you know they don't always release you know how how many people are watching or whatever. And but in yeah. terms of just like mainstream, you know, you went into Target. And all the toy aisles were covered with those Playmates Next Generation toys, you know, in, in, in you mm-hmm. know, in in mainstream toy stores and and you know uh, places like Target in the United States. And you know, there was um, in the eighties, there was you know like six to seven Star Trek novels coming out a year. You know, you know, mm-hmm. this was before the boom of like the Star Wars novels at the beginning of the nineties, and even into the nineties. You know, like there there would be um, you know you know there would be like sometimes a new Star Trek novel every other month. Oh you yeah. Know what I mean. You know, um, and, you know, the conventions were huge. You know, Star Trek was it, 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 for, you know, what we generally call geek culture. Star Trek was the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it was the biggest science fiction franchise and it was bigger than Star Wars in the 90s. You know what I mean? Because Star Wars didn't exist in the 90s for the most part. You know, right. Star Wars existed as comic books and novels. But, I mean, you had, you know, multiple hit TV shows in the 90s from star trek so my fandom is is connected to that you know what i mean like i mm-hmm. I, I i wrote like a review of all good things the next generation finale in like my diary when i was in sixth grade you know when i was like 13 <laughs> that's amazing you know, it's kind of like you know i was kind of like you know i'd like had all like you know whoa does so-and-so have a crush on me or not you know here's what we did at school and then there's this like okay tonight was the finale of the next generation mm-hmm. my parents let me stay up late but, you know, like a lot of people, I have really strong memories of also um, seeing that uh, Star Trek The Next Generation season three finale where Captain Picard is assimilated into the Borg and it's yeah. a cliffhanger. And then I had the summer. I had the summer then to have my mind blown and be like, oh, my God, is Riker going to be the captain? You know, are they going to get Picard back? Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of my childhood um, was just really and, and with Deep Space Nine and Voyager 2. I was a little mm-hmm. older, you know, by the time voyager ends i'm graduating from high school you know yeah. um so but um and then enterprise starts and i'm in college so it's like that span from 87 to 2005 is 18 years of star trek on television mm-hmm. and that's when i grew up you know literally yeah. you know so i would say that i can't imagine my childhood i can't imagine coming of age without star trek and so it's such it's a secular religion, I suppose, in in my in my intellectual <laughs> and emotional world. Yes. You know, I, I was saying this to a friend of mine. We were talking about Picard season three, and I was just like, "Yeah, like I can't untangle my emotions." For, and I'm a professional TV critic, right? And I'm a professional mm-hmm. like pop culture historian, but I'm like, I cannot untangle my emotions from some of this stuff because it's like, I don't know if you're are you caught up on Picard season three. Uh, I didn't watch the latest one, but I I pretty much yeah. So one episode behind, basically. Right. So and I'm a couple. I'm I'm ahead of you because I'm a journalist, so I've seen the the last couple. But um, okay. yeah. So like little things, you know, just like Data's return, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, like things yeah. like that, where you're just like, I'm just like, oh my god, you know, like it's just I, I'm. It's very emotional. But um, so yeah, I, I don't. Does I understand that question? <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> this uh, this uh, like. I don't want to get too much on a tangent here, but I just want to express my opinion also about Picard. This latest uh, season is, is yeah, it's great. Uh, very, very good. Like uh, bringing back a lot of those characters has helped uh, probably up the ratings of the show and uh, bring back a lot of nostalgia, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I think our stories are quite similar in the fact that uh, I was also growing up in the late uh, late 80s, 90s, and uh, I also wrote stories involving the Borg and <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, it, it had an impact on me for sure. Uh, I think uh, it made me curious about life and made me curious about what's out there, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I think that also because it's a book podcast, I think that yeah. something that I like to say about my book about Phasers on Stun is that mm-hmm. it contains other books inside of it. You yeah. know, because the other thing about Star Trek, and this is true of the original series and the films and the next generation, is that it is very literary in that mm-hmm. it introduces 
uh, young people or anyone really to a lot of different kinds of books. I was talking to Patrick Stewart um, before uh, Picard season two, and some of this made it into my uh, um, the book um, because my I had to finish my book in early early 2022. So mm -hmm. and now I'm like, oh my god, now there's it's already outdated. Um, hopefully, I'll do a paperback in 2026 uh, for the 60th anniversary. But um, yeah. you know, I I got into Dickens because of Patrick Stewart. Mm. because of star trek you know because he in the 90s was doing a one-man show of a christmas carol mm -hmm. you know so i was like in fourth grade or something i remember getting the cassettes of him you know going into walden books and buying the cassettes of of, of patrick stewart doing yeah. a one-man show. you know there's no way that he would have been doing that if he wasn't captain picard you know he wouldn't mm -hmm. have been you know he was he was doing that because of his success in the next generation and I mean, I told him this. I was like, you know, I, I got into Charles Dickens. But he's like, oh, that is very meaningful to me. But it's true. You know, my I love Sherlock Holmes. I love Shakespeare. You know what I mean? Like I, and all of this literature I got into through Star Trek. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. You know what I mean? I wouldn't have. I am. A, I'm obsessed with Sherlock Holmes. And I would not have been obsessed with Sherlock Holmes if it weren't for mm -hmm. um, Star Trek. You know, many people, I say this in the book, are obsessed with Moby Dick, you know, because yeah. of the Wrath of Khan, you know what I mean? I used to do a, a marathon reading in New York uh, where we would do, or all these writers over three days would do sections of Moby Dick and we'd read all of Moby Dick out loud. And every time uh, it got to the, um, you know, uh, from hell's heart, I, I stab at the, you know, for hate's sake, you know, somebody in the audience would yell, Khan! You know, because the, cause, cause the Wrath of Khan had subsumed the Moby Dick revenge speech from Ahab towards the end of that novel, mm -hmm. we associate that now more with Khan than we do with Melville, mm. you know, as yeah. a culture. And so yeah. I think that Trek, you know, and then of course Picard, you know, has um, uh, talks about Moby Dick and First Contact, and then that's an interesting reversal. So that novel is unpacked in a different way. But Star Trek's always having all these great, I just wrote an article about this the other day because there's Sherlock Holmes stuff in episode eight of, of Star Trek Picard. There's a huge Sherlock Holmes moment and Data talks about, uh, it, we see Data's pipe and hat when he pretended to be Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. But he also uses a Sherlock Holmes tactic of organizing his thoughts. And that's what sort of, um, that intellectual um, exercise is like the secret weapon, right? So then, mm -hmm. that's, then Star Trek's using a Sherlock Holmes concept uh, for the heroes to succeed. Um, so yeah, I think that literature, my, my love of writing and books is also connected to Star Trek, right? Because it's such a literate, yeah, uh, um, such a literate pop culture phenomenon. For sure. So why this book at, at this time? And do, by the way, do you have a copy of the book with you right now? You, I, can you know, I forgot it. to I forgot to bring it with me. I, I ah, I'm okay. sorry. It was a busy yeah, day. Okay. I'm I'm in well, my recording studio near my no house. But no, I, I didn't I didn't bring it. Um, no yeah, I can. Yeah, but um, I'll just put it up here on the yeah the, yeah you, yeah yeah. Do you have a copy of it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> If you have a yeah, copy, I mean, I've got the it. audio book. So yeah, uh, yeah, we could, yeah, we'll do a screen share or something like that. It's got yeah, Spock yeah, on the cover. Me. It's easy to find. Um, yeah. yeah. So I I decided uh, during um, lockdown, I was working on a few ideas for a new nonfiction book after my first book, um, and I thought. Um, I, first, I thought I wanted to do a book about the Wrath of Khan because in 2022, the Wrath of Khan celebrated its 40th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years before that, I was kind of like, okay, what if nobody's really done a deep dive on the Wrath of Khan? And my agent was like, eh, it feels like a little thin just because you don't get to talk about all these other aspects of the Star Trek franchise if you only talk about the Wrath of Khan. And I was like, okay. And he's just like, well, what is it about the Wrath of Khan that's so great? And I'm like, well, it just radically reinvented the franchise. Um, but it also then made people think that the franchise had always been that way. And so it became an instant classic, even though it was actually very radical and um, unorthodox at the time. And he's like, OK, well, why is that significant? And I said, well, because that's all Star Trek's ever done. It just constantly changes in this really radical way that like is a huge departure. And then that new iteration then becomes classic. Right. At some right. point. And that's not really true of other uh, uh, pop culture phenomena. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you'd be like, oh, well, you know, what about James Bond or Batman? And it's like, well, it's still about the same character. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you know, what what Star Trek proved is that you didn't even need to have the Enterprise at a certain point. <laughs> you know what I mean? To be uh -huh. Star Trek. And so it's a very malleable 
you know, again, take like Sherlock Holmes, you know, how many Sherlock Holmes iterations have there been? A lot. How many successful Sherlock Holmes spinoffs are about, uh, you know, an, a side character like Inspector mm -hmm. Lestrade or something? Zero. You know what right. I mean? Like, but like Star yeah. Trek was like, with you know, things like Deep Space Nine or Voyager or even the next generation itself were like, well, what if we just had all these other characters? So I said this to my mm -hmm. agent. He was like, why don't you just do a book about that, about how Star Trek just constantly reinvents itself? And I, he's like, could you do that? And I was like, yeah. So I, I thought, well, the 2022 May was the 40th anniversary of the Wrath of Khan. So I thought that was a good, a good news peg. But also at the time, this time last year, Strange New Worlds was getting ready to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and I had done a lot. I've been doing a lot of reporting on the new shows since 2016 for various mm -hmm. publications. And so I'm like, well, nobody's done a history book of Star Trek that also talked about the new shows. Uh, yeah. um, you know, and so I, I'm friends with uh, Mark Altman and Ed Gross, who did the 50 year mission oral history of the whole series. But that book came out in 2016. So then it only right. got up so to that's... it only got up to beyond to Star Trek Beyond the the mm -hmm. third of the um, reboot films, and I'd been covering Discovery and Lower Decks and Picard like really a lot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, uh, publications like Inverse and Den of Geek and Sci Fi Wire and for Star Trek dot com uh, and more recently for Esquire. But I was just kind of like, well, I got to do something with all this reporting that mm -hmm. I've been doing, you know, and so that was also part of it. I was I was motivated. And because I knew Strange New Worlds was going to be like this kind of like, it, I knew it was going to make a big splash and it did, you know, yeah. and I knew that it was going to, and I I was, and, you know, and it's very recognizable. It's got the Enterprise and the matching uniforms and Spock and, you know, uh, Uhura. Um, I am, um, I thought that that would be, and so, yeah, my book came out, I think like when Spock Amok, uh, the fifth episode of that season was airing. So that was the other reason of a why a why now is Strange New Worlds. I thought, I, and I still think was a good. I think Strange New Worlds is a good place to start uh, with the new shows. If you're like, you know, what are the new shows like? I would say you could start with Strange New Worlds. And I had yeah. had a little bit of Strange New Worlds reporting because I had interviewed Anson Mount, who plays Captain Pike, and Ethan Peck, who plays Spock, when they were in Discovery. And yeah. so I had had a bunch of stuff that I I talked to them at length about those roles. And so I thought that would mm -hmm. be a nice way. So that was why. That was why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. totally, totally. Um, yeah. So uh, you mentioned that Star Trek changes over time, which is very true. Like we've got this whole new Trek, uh, so to say, since Discovery. And uh, so, what do you think the purpose of Star Trek has been since it was like released in the nineteen sixties all the way up until now? And of course, it is continuously evolving so what what is the purpose of star trek you think well i think that there is the purpose of star trek and the popularity of star trek and then there's mm -hmm. also the <laughs> the cultural significance of star trek and these things are not always related yeah but I'll answer is it you, entertainment but, is it ph philosophical yeah. is it political is it yeah, yeah. so i'll answer your question <laughs> in a way that it was phrased you used what is the purpose of star trek and i do think that that it, that that could unite some of those sort of disparate views i think the mm -hmm. purpose of it was what roddenberry pitched which was that it was a action adventure science fiction show for mm -hmm. adults very key for adults with continuing characters okay People like to jump to Star Trek was important because of uh, it had uh, racial diversity, because it had a hopeful vision of the future. These things are true. And, and they're a big part of my book. But they're also after the fact. Like, that's why it became culturally important. The purpose initially is actually very profound when you consider before Star Trek was pitched in 1964, there had never been a science fiction show, meaning that a show that took science fiction seriously in an intellectual way. Right. For adults, okay, well, what about the Twilight Zone? What about the Outer Limits? Uh -uh. With continuing characters, mm -hmm. week to week. Never. People go, what about Doctor Who in 1963? That was a children's show. That was created as a children's show that wasn't marketed as, as adults initially. It was created as a family show. What about Lost in Space? Again, that was a family show. 
that was mm-hmm. you know and and also i think we can agree that you know i love lost in space but it doesn't take science fiction that seriously mm-hmm. what about flash gordon well again those were serials that were aimed at at, at families you know you, you it, what, what about a show called men into space there was one continuing character and it was still basically an anthology show right the idea that you would just have an action adventure science fiction show that then that looked at science fiction literature and recruited science fiction authors right like theodore sturgeon uh um or um george clayton johnson who wrote the first aired episode of of star trek ever the man trap um who who Hmm. co-wrote logan's run the novel um you know uh robert block who wrote psycho you know wrote three episodes of star trek the original series parlin ellison of course very famous science fiction writer who wrote city in the age of forever the idea that you would Mm -hmm. recruit writers of prose who had written for the outer limits and twilight zone you know who had written for serling you know and the outer limits producers but then say hey, okay now you've got these set characters and you have to do that so then you take that right and you go okay that was a radical concept in 1964 when roddenberry pitched it to herb solo who was uh the guy who sold it uh for desi lu to nbc eventually mm-hmm. um so then you go then you go okay well then what about the rest of it it's like it's the same thing you know the next generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, Discovery, Picard, Strange New Worlds. These are basically usually action adventure science fiction shows, usually for adults, that are um, take science fiction themes seriously, right? So what that means is that there are intellectual explorations of the human condition in sort of hyperbolic sci-fi settings, right? Right. That doesn't mean that every single installment of every Star Trek is, is some kind of like, you know, um, you know, deep philosophical, you know, sort of exploration of a topic. Sometimes that's not the case, mm-hmm. but that it is usually these things are treated seriously and they're not just a one off like they were in the Twilight Zone or, you know, it, nowadays like Black Mirror or something like that. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that there is an implication that this exists in a realistic or at least plausible world and really it is really shocking like how different star trek is from other science fiction of the 60s and even the 70s because then Mm -hmm. in the 70s shows just kind of tried to start copying it space 1999 being the the most egregious example but even shows like glennie larson's like battlestar galactica in 1978 or the buck rogers show in 1979 even these shows copy elements of star trek's structure and it's and its maturity uh, you know, to, to varying degrees of, of success. Um, but you really, it really is the model. Other than Doctor Who, which is its own separate phenomenon, you really can't find another science fiction show where the premise is what if every week? What if this? What if that? And then the answer isn't violence, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, yeah. And I think that, like, you know, I love Star Wars, but, you know, oftentimes the answer in Star Wars, particularly with the newer shows, is violence. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, well, we're going to blow it up. You know what I mean? We got to, whatever it is, we got to blow it up. And in Star Trek, the answer was usually a lot more complex than that. And that's even true of the newer shows. You know, like I was talking about Picard, you know, one of the most recent episodes, it's like, you know, Data outwits Lore. He doesn't destroy him. And and Geordi mm-hmm. looks directly at the camera, basically, says Data's ethical subroutines prevent him from taking a life. You know, this is in 2023. Star Trek's been doing this for almost 60 years, where they say mm-hmm. the good guys can't kill people for no reason. So they have to figure out another way uh Mm -hmm. to win and i think that that ties into its purpose as well is that frequently star trek's purpose is to tell action adventure stories that aren't violent and if there Mm -hmm. is violence in them it's used in a storytelling way that is that feels like it's it's not uh casual you know what Mm -hmm. i mean there's not there's not a there's not a a, you know the the fact the book is called faders on stun is pointed because they have weapons that don't murder, you know, right. like that is literally ingrained in the show. And I talked to Walter Koenig about this, who played Chekhov for the book. And I was like, do you think that's a good title for the book? He's like, I think it's great because yeah. it means that we people don't have to murder each other. You know what I mean? That yes. there's another option. And, I, you know, but it still allows for that action adventure gunslinger element uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that Gene Roddenberry came from because he used to write Westerns. So he was able to adapt you know, look at the first few minutes of the first Star Wars movie. You know, the stormtroopers set their blasters on stun to capture Princess Leia. They, that's you know, yeah. taken from Star Trek. You know, yeah. and so, um, yeah, that I think so. I think that's the purpose. Is it, 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 they're they're action adventure stories with a conscience. 
you know, mm-hmm. and I think that, but they are action adventure stories. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I think that's people, people sometimes like, oh, like, well, Star Trek is so deep. And it's like, no, 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 it's okay that it's an action adventure franchise. That's okay. You know, it's yes. just that they have, is it's just that unlike other action adventure franchises, they have a lot more, there's the body count isn't as high. And, and, and there are consequences to violence. <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> for sure. Star the, Trek. the prime yeah. directive, you know, you mentioned yeah. that a few times and uh, I, I like the story behind that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's what makes Star Trek unique as well. And also the just the drive for um, seeking out new life, <laughs> new civilizations, you know, the, the, I mean, yeah, it's it's unique for sure. Yeah. Could you tell us that story uh, behind the uh, uh, the prime directive? Who was it? Dean? Oh, Gene Coons, Coon. Yes. Right? Or Gene. Gene sorry, Coon. Gene. Yeah. Gene, Gene, Gene Coon. Yeah, there are yeah. two genes associated yes. with the Star Trek, the original series. Gene Ronbury is famously the creator of Star Trek, the original yeah. series and Star Trek, the next generation. Um, uh, but he had a, uh, a a producer who was essentially what, what we would now call a showrunner mm-hmm. um, named named Gene Coon. Uh, who was a script editor for Star Trek, the original series in the first season and some of the second season. He actually comes in midway through season one. Um, if you want to get really granular, uh, mm-hmm. there's a guy named John F.D. Black. I might get those initials reversed. You have to look in the book. Um, who was script editing before that. But when Gene Kuhn is sort of the writer for Star Trek who invents the prime directive, the idea that the uh, Starfleet members in the federation can't interfere with other cultures right that they're not allowed to just go which is sort of like anti-colonialist right like yeah. that, like that it, it says that you know in the future we just can't go out into space and you know colonize people and make them like us you know we have to sort of accept things as they are and that we really only make contact with them as if we feel like their technology you know, warrants it otherwise we'll yeah. influence them and you know, all this other stuff and of course, that's a central conflict in breaking the prime, prime directive creates all these great ethical quandaries. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a an element in the novel in the Dune novels that are the reverse of that, right? Where the Bene Gesserit actually seed uh, <laughs> uh, planets <laughs> with ideas. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're the, they're the reverse of the prime directive. You know, they're like, oh no, we're gonna t- we're gonna give them our religion way before. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, so that 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 exists too. You know, um, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's, and, and so then you know the idea that uh, Star Trek would be have these humanist stories. Um, you know, Roddenberry's guidance, but Gene Kuhn kind of hammered that into an existence, particularly in the episode Devil in the Dark. Um, where there, you know, you think that this, uh, you know, rock monster that looks like a pizza is murdering all <laughs> these people in the mines, and only to find out that it's a mother protecting it. You know, it's a misunderstood monster. And yeah. so that's a big, and I think that's a big part of uh, of Trek. You know, that's that that theme that theme comes up a lot. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, Star Trek fans. You mentioned Trekkie and Trekker, right? <laughs> so uh, what what's the difference, Trekkie and Trekker? Well, there's probably no difference, particularly not in 20, not in 2023. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so essentially that in the 60s, there was a kind of a feeling that um, as the Star Trek fan movement was in its infancy, that Trekkie was sort of this pejorative term that was used by other people in the science fiction community to sort of mock Star Trek fans. And then in order to kind of reclaim it, some of the 70s fans that sort of organized the first convention, most of whom were women, incidentally, um, sort of were like, no, no, we're Trekkers because it sounds less pejorative. And they kind of like use that as sort of a badge of honor. And that was still kind of, you'll still see this through, you know, the 90s. And even today, some older fans will will like make it a point to say Trekker. Um, but, you know, in the book, I kind of just make a joke about how like, I, I don't know, when I was a kid, I always was a Trekkie and I thought that that was an okay term. Yeah, um, me too. And um, <laughs> I think that, I think enough time has passed that any of these terms are fine. You know what I mean? That none of them are particularly, and that, but I do think that that said is I do appreciate that there were people in the seventies, people like Jacqueline Lincolnsburg, uh, who I interviewed for the book, um, who were like some of the earliest fans who were saying, or Deborah Langsom, who made the first Star Trek fanzine, Mm 
Spacanalia, who I also interviewed for the book, these people were sticking up for the fandom in a serious way. And so mm -hmm. I appreciate that they were being like, no, call us Trekkers. Um, but, you know, I mean, today, I don't think that there's much distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So we've talked a lot about the kind of the history of Trek and philosophy and stuff like that. I, I want to jump into um, like, what's your opinion on new Trek compared to old Trek, let's say, uh, you know, TOS and TNG and Voyager, DS9, Enterprise compared to maybe the Abrams verse and then also the uh, the newest one since Discovery. Yeah. Is there any difference well, between the two? Or, uh, well, sure. Some people but that are also quite skepti skeptical of like the LGBT uh, Q plus and like I yeah. find that there there's some people that are fighting against that so yeah well uh, those I, are kind well, of two questions yeah <laughs> yeah so there's kind of two things the first thing is pretty easy to address is that people that don't like the new Star Trek shows because there's like representation of queer people are in a huge minority yeah. you know what I mean like that's not it, that would be like somebody who didn't like Deep Space Nine because Cisco was black Mm -hmm. you know it's just you don't get it like you're, you're they seem like guy. trolls you know <laughs> yeah so like but but i would also say that that's it's almost a con i mean it's a conversation worth having because bigots are horrible but it's also mm -hmm. not unique to star trek bigots are just bigots right yeah there's nothing about representation in star trek that is anti-star trek or has anything to do uh star trek is able to is continually in each decade able to do more and more representation as the culture changes um and I write about that a lot in the book. So mm -hmm. I don't think that I don't now. So I don't I think that anybody who has a negative opinion of the new shows and it's and it's tied to representation. I don't think that that's a legitimate argument. Right. Like there's right. just a, it's completely illegitimate argument. If there are people that feel like the new shows are different and that's and it's not because of, you know, then they're not frustrated by the diversity or whatever. And they have actual issues with like some of the storytelling. I actually am sympathetic to some of that because the new shows are all very different from each other. And mm -hmm. they also are, are different season to season. And some of that has behind the scene changes. But, um, so anyway, yeah, I think that, you know, if you, let's just put racist and sexist bigots to the side, because they're not unique to Star Trek. And then just talk about, okay, well, what is the response to the new shows? Or you could also say from 2009, right, with the new films right mm -hmm. the jj abrams yeah. films and the reason why i think it's reasonable to connect those phenomena is because of alex kurtzman alex kurtzman co-wrote uh with roberto orsi the 2009 star trek reboot uh that was written mm -hmm. by jj abrams he also co-wrote star trek into darkness and currently since 2016 and 2017 with the launch of star trek discovery alex kurtzman has essentially been in charge of star trek he's the executive mm -hmm. producer of all the shows um, so everything that sort of gets approved or doesn't get approved goes through him. Um, his role is similar to that of Rick Berman's in the 90s, who was the kind of Roddenberry's um, protege who kind of took over day-to-day -day operations of Star Trek for the next generation and Deep Space Nine and Voyager and Enterprise mm -hmm. um, in that era. I call everything from 1987 to 2005 the 90s. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, because from, the, from a Trekkie point of view, that's what it is. But also, yeah. it, it also feels culturally correct you're like, yeah, that was the '90s. Um, <laughs> you know, that 18 yeah. years was the '90s. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah. so now you've got, you know, it's been uh, just over five years um, since Kurtzman launched Star Trek Discovery, that who was co-created by Brian Fuller. Um, and it should be noted that Brian Fuller wrote for Voyager, who was one of the older shows. But mm -hmm. I think the most, the biggest difference between Star Trek post-2005 with the end of Enterprise um, and Star Trek post-2009 and post-2017 with the new films and Discovery is economics, um, mm -hmm. is that the Star Trek shows, the way that they were made in the 60s was they were constantly in danger of cancellation and behind the eight ball always. And then in the 80s and 90s, the shows, with the exception of Voyager and Enterprise, were syndicated which means that they were funded by Paramount, but they weren't beholden to a network, right? Hmm. 
So Star Trek was able to kind of operate sort of independently and do different kinds of things that didn't have to go through like the same kinds of approval that a network TV show would have. Mm. So fast forward to 2017 and you now you have these streaming only shows, right? Direct to streaming, which is, if you squint, kind of like syndication, right? It's not like Star Trek was on a network TV show. It's not like it's on the CW or, mm-hmm. you know, um, something like that. You know what I mean? Um, you know, many successful genre shows are, um, you know, on those kinds of direct networks. It's not like it's on ABC or something like that or NBC like it originally was. It's direct, you know, it was CBS All Access. Now it's Paramount+. Plus. So, but with the streaming thing, it just creates a different model, right? The way these shows is just made or different, you know, mm-hmm. in, in the older, you know, the TV seasons used to be 26 episodes long, 23 episodes long. Now TV seasons are like, you know, 10 episodes long. Yeah. In, in, the, <laughs> in the 90s, it was rare for shows like Deep Space Nine to have serialized stories that played out over s- several seasons. Even the idea that Captain Picard's trauma from the next generation from being assimilated by the Borg would carry over into subsequent episodes was rare for TV mm. for, for 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 primetime TV right because generally speaking the characters just kind of had to like reset and be like fine the next week right mm. because that's how TV was made back then um you know with the exception of soap operas you know um <laughs> that would obviously have like that but that was daytime TV right that wasn't like primetime so now you get into the the 21st century and suddenly the sopranos has happened and Lost has happened, and Battlestar mm-hmm. Galactica happened, which, again, Battlestar Galactica was uh, the reboot on the Sci-Fi Channel, was yeah. uh, produced by Ron Moore, who got his start writing on The Next Generation, and was a producer on Deep Space Nine, and wrote two of The Next Generation films, including First Contact. Oh, yeah. So again, you don't have, a, yet again, another important cultural landmark you wouldn't even have if it weren't for Star Trek. Because Ron Moore cut his teeth on Star Trek, and you know that his, mm-hmm. you, you, can, you can see that in Battlestar. Yes, definitely. And, and and his current show for all mankind, which is a a great Apple TV sci-fi show that everybody should watch, which is excellent. Um, but still got to um, check it out. Oh, it's, I still it's have wonderful. to check it out. You, if you like Battlestar and you like Star Trek, you got to watch for all mankind. It's the best. Huh? Um, it's just absolutely fantastic. Um, but I'm not alone. You know, Rolling Stone named that as one of the best shows of 2021 or whatever. So like that's you know, but uh, I think the best they named it in 2021. Um, but um. You know, so the new shows are made differently and they're made with different economic constraints. And I think that with Discovery, each season was sort of trying to do a different serialized arc. And because they had a lot of behind the scenes changes with writers and producers, and we I don't really feel like getting into the details of that. (laughs) But there have been a lot of behind the scenes changes on that show for a variety of reasons, much like The Next Generation had in its first two years. The difference is, is that there's just fewer episodes. And so if people are like, I don't understand the premise of this show, it's because it did change from season to season. Mm-hmm. And there's not enough, there are not as many episodes for them to sort of play around with different ideas. Um, Picard, Star Trek Picard, uh, now in its third season, is also similar. You know, it had different, it's had different producers and showrunners behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, Terry, Terry Metalis, who is the showrunner for season three, came in in season two, but season three was almost entirely his baby and his vision. And he's a writer that worked on Enterprise and Voyager as a PA in the 90s, you know. And, you know, then he went on to do like the Sci-Fi Channel 12 Monkeys reboot, which is also a great show if people haven't seen it. Um, But he, you know, brought in some of his own writers, you know, and stuff for Picard season three. And it's very different. Um, you know, Henry Alonzo Meyer, who's the showrunner of Strange New Worlds, has different writers than Discovery. Some of them cross over, some of them don't. Um, so, you know, if people feel like these shows are really different from each other, it's because they're written by different people. And mm-hmm. those writers have changed over time. Um, I think the biggest thing that people say is that Discovery was anti-Star Trek because it was too violent and it was too dark. And I think that that is a superficial argument, but it's an understandable one. I think it's superficial because the original series is very dark uh, and and very violent, um, but it was about hope through that darkness. You know, I think that Deep Space Nine is very dark uh, and there's, you know, there's some episode of The Next Generation where Captain Picard is tortured, uh, which is very famous, Chain of Command. You know, so there's darkness in Star Trek. And I think that Discovery's ultimate message is that the Star Trek uh, uh, 
philosophy of achieving some kind of resolution through peace is what that first season ends up being about. Mm -hmm. Did we need 14 episodes to get there? Some people would argue no. Um, But I don't think that Discovery betrayed any kind of like Star Trek ideals. I just think that it was made as a slightly edgier um, action show that was going for an audience that maybe didn't care about Star Trek. And so Mm -hmm. it went very big in terms of trying to reinvent those aesthetics. And I think that a lot of them are largely successful. And I think that Star Trek Discovery season one, despite some of its tonal incongruities, actually holds up better than people remember. Yeah. Um, and if you go and watch it now, like Jason Isaacs, you know, is is amazing in it. He plays, you know, Captain Lorca, who, yeah. spoiler alert, is, is, a, is this secret villain, but he's a Starfleet captain. And then, you know, the Mirror Universe stuff is really interesting because you have Michelle Yeoh playing two different versions of herself, you know, way before her current turn in the multiverse. And, yeah. you know, uh, you know, and um, so a lot of the performances in Discovery Season 1 are really interesting. Rain Wilson is really interesting as Harry Mudd, as this kind of darker oh, yeah. version of Harry Mudd. Sure. There's, a great ti- there's a great time loop episode um, there. And then, you know, of course, with Discovery Season 2, Kurtzman and others, Akiva Goldsman, uh, one of the producers there, were kind of like, okay, well, we're going to listen to the fans and we're going to, this character, Michael Bur- Burnham, Sneak with Martin Green's character, if she is really Spock's half, if she's Spock's human sister, yeah. then let's bring in Spock. You know, and so then I think that what you've seen is then the shows sort of responding a lot to fan feedback in a way yeah. that the shows in the 90s didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because like in the 90s, Roddenberry was like, we're not going to reference the original series, you know, on the next generation. You know, sure, DeForest Kelly as a cameo as Bones and Encounter at Farpoint, but like they were actually not allowed to. It wasn't until like season three that they could say Spock on the next generation, you know. Mm-hmm. And so the, the next generation actually established its identity by not giving old fans what they wanted. It said, no, yeah. we're not going to make the original. It's a new thing. So that's very different. So like, what the what ha- what has happened in the new shows is that in less than a couple years, you know, by 2019, Star Trek Discovery was going, okay, we are going to give you the Enterprise. We are going to give you Spock. We're going to, you know, and, you know, and then now, um, you know, it's just a few years after that, it, it is, you know, people would call this fan service or sort of um, uh, uh, um, sort of catering to the fans, but they've actually listened to fan feedback in real time more than the other shows used to. Um, mm-hmm. Does that mean that the shows are necessarily as good as the old shows? I don't know. I think that there are some standout episodes from all the new shows. I think Lower Decks is pretty consistent. Um, yeah. it's kind of the comedic one. Yes. And I think that, and I think that this season of Picard is sort of like a masterclass in how you do serialized television that also has all of these great science fiction themes that Star Trek has had. You know, um, how do you fight your inner demons? You know, like in the original mm-hmm. series, how do you embrace your negative side? What if the thing in the nebula is actually alive? You know, uh, yeah. you know, what are the ethics of fighting against an enemy that's biologically different than us? You know, and, and then of course, that it's ultimately about people. Um, and then you could be like, well, what is it like to get older and still want to be on adventures and all these things? And so <laughs> yeah. I think that, you know, all of that is, re- and I think that for people that grew up with those characters, it's very cathartic because, you know, the idea that Riker and Jean-Luc Picard and Beverly Crusher are parents is extremely cathartic for people who viewed those people as parental figures in the nineties. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then the idea that I now relate to Will Riker as a father is, is, is quite profound. Mm -hmm. So I would say that like, if the, if people are like, you know, I don't like the new shows or whatever, I would just be like, "Eh, okay, well watch strange new worlds and watch Picard season three and get back to me. You know, I actually happen to, I actually happen to love uh, discovery season two. And I'm a, I really like discovery season three. Um, I'm not Mm -hmm. as, I I didn't love discovery season four as much, but um, Mm -hmm. But I would have no, any Star Trek fan who was like, who watched Strange New World season one or Picard season three and said they didn't like it. I would just be like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what to say. Those those two seasons of two very different shows 
you know, with almost very little crossover of writers. Like Akiva Goldsman is a producer on both. But, uh-huh. you know, season three is mostly Terry Metalis and his people. And, and Strange New Worlds is mostly Henry Alonzo Meyer and his writers. And uh-huh. that's kind of it, you know. And, um, yeah, I don't know why. If, I don't know how somebody could sit through those seasons and say this isn't Star Trek. Mm-hmm. I, I would just be. Yeah, yeah, particularly totally not, agree with particularly you. not, uh, particularly not right now, and particularly when the last two episodes of Picard season three come out, I just will be like, okay, like, are you still mad? Because <laughs> there's <laughs> some stuff coming, my friend, that you're going to be like, wow, they went there, and it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you about Discovery as well. I love the first two seasons; those were great. Yeah. Totally something fresh and new, you know. Uh, and then, of course, Picard uh, season three is hitting it spot on. So we've got some really good Trek. Um, and uh, I'm sure we've got plenty of more Trek coming soon as well. Right? I even think so, a, yeah. Even a new, uh, I don't know, a new movie coming up soon? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's been again. Uh... I think I think the economics of that are weird. You know what I mean? Because science fiction franchises, you know, like the the Abrams movies, were very financially successful. But yeah. you got to figure the first Abrams reboot movie came out the the year after Iron Man. You know. Yeah. So so the 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 the, the bar for geek franchise blockbusters had not really been raised yet in terms mm-hmm. of how much money these movies were supposed to make. Chris Pine said this in 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 an interview last year. Is he was kind of like, you know, I thought this movie's making millions was enough, but he's like, I feel like that these studios want billions now, you know. Yeah. So like when the Force Awakens or whatever comes out in like 2015, you know, I say this in the book, but like, look, a Star Trek film, even a really mainstream action adventure Star Trek film directed by J.J. Abrams, is just never going to make as much money as a Star Wars movie. And the reason why is that Star Trek's just a little bit more liberal. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It just is. Um, yeah. And I and I mean that like politically, but I just also mean that like you could also just say Star Trek is just not as conservative because, mm-hmm. you know, people are like, oh, how could a how could a conservative like and I don't have problems with conservatives. or <laughs> right. You know, I'm not saying that I do, but I'm just saying that there are a lot of ultra right wing people that love Star Wars because it has a lot of guns and violence in it and it and it, and it you know whereas i think you find fewer people like that who love it's just star trek is just less mainstream because it's i would it say is, yes <laughs> because it is more political right mm-hmm. it's less mainstream because it is more political and so you could never have a star trek movie make a billion dollars because you could never have because it would be very hard to convince someone who doesn't agree with the Star Trek values to go see it, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. like kind of like what you were suggesting, you know, whereas like, I'm sorry, but Star Wars just, it, it has, it, it's, it's, it's more centrist and mm-hmm. you'd be like, well, Star Wars is, is anti-fascist and all that thing. And, and that's all true. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of diversity in a new hope in the first Star mm-hmm. Wars movie. There just isn't there, right. you know, there's not a lot of, you know, it's about war. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not about exploration, you know. So I think that because of that, there's just and I love Star Wars and I love some of yeah. these messages too. But it, it it's not as you know, this is changing a little bit with the Star Wars shows on TV, but it, it it's it's not as dynamic in terms of like what those stories can be about. It you know, seems war, more like cookie cutter, like hero's journey type of writing, right? Well, yeah, it, <laughs> and, and even when they subvert that on a show like Andor or something like that. It's still a show in which, like, in which violence is still very central to the narratives, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not something that the characters necessarily stop to think about as much. Like, we we don't think for a second about Luke Skywalker killing all those people on the Death Star. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? We don't think for a second about, you know, the Mandalorian, like, killing a sandworm or whatever in The Mandalorian Season 2. But, mm-hmm. you know, like, on Star Trek, you know, this is the kind of thing they do all the time. You know, like, you know, Star Trek Discovery Season 3, like, they're like, oh, we let's not kill this trans worm and then like even the season of picard like beverly crusher is like i don't know if we can target these shapeshifters based on their biology because that's unethical you know what yeah. I mean? this is the middle this is in the middle of an action yeah. adventure show where they're all about to die and they're kind of like i don't know if we should do this star wars <laughs> doesn't really have that 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 level or if it does talk about it it kind of skips to the aftermath of the of the bad, you know, of the war crime, (laughs) you know, so to speak, you know, so I think that, I think it's just, but you know, 
everything has its place and i'm not saying that that i think star trek is better but i do think it's more contemplative yeah right like i do think sure. it, it's it's a more contemplative style of storytelling usually mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah so um you've got this great quote in your book that i just want to touch on uh, before we wrap things up here so the perfect version of star trek has not yet been made true fans know that to love Star Trek is to love something that is deeply flawed. Others don't understand this who, who have never seen Star Trek. Can you touch a little bit on that? I so. think that, yeah, I think that it's one of the greatest epiphanies that I've had about Star Trek, but also about art in general, mm -hmm. right? Like is that if there, if something is kind of just great and there's not a lot of things you can sort of pick apart, it, it, it's it doesn't create a fandom you know mm -hmm. what i mean like yeah. you know what i mean it just doesn't because there, there's no there's no gaps to fill in right mm -hmm. um you know a lot of people have written about this you know michael shabon has written about this but like you know why like i'm obsessed with sherlock holmes right like well why is sherlock holmes so popular and it's like well because there's all these gaps in in what we understand about sherlock holmes and so then the fans mm -hmm. started filling it all in right and all of those imperfect where's where was watson shot was it in his shoulder or his leg you know and then like <laughs> the fans are like ah there's something happening here and there's some other story and so i think that those kinds of inconsistencies um even in, in trek and because trek's so big and there's all this like well what happened to this space space station and what happened to that version of the enterprise and what the hell was Worf doing you know um yeah all that all that stuff is it, it just is it, it fires the imagination and you know other franchises have this too but I think the comparison I made was to the original Star Wars trilogy is that those movies are a little tighter than than a star than most Star Trek films. You know what I mean? Yeah. In terms of like they, they kind of tell you everything you need to know, and then like so I think that the reason why people get disappointed with new Star Wars projects is because it's kind of diminishing returns. It's sort of like, well, The Empire Strikes Back is pretty perfect, so I don't really know if we need to keep going to that well whereas with star trek i would say that like the greatest star trek moment you know whether it's like the wrath of khan in 82 or like star trek first contact in 1996 or like an episode of deep space nine you know like you know uh, uh far beyond the stars or you know whatever you know what i mean is that none of these things will ever capture the totality of why star trek is great and none of them will ever be quite perfect, even though each of them is a masterpiece within the context yeah. of Trek. It would be like, again, just to use like a Sherlock Holmes example, it'd be like, well, what's the best Sherlock Holmes story to read? And it's like all of them. You know what I mean? Like, because mm -hmm. if you just read a study, if you just read a study in Scarlet, which is the first one, then you miss some things. If you just read Hound of the Baskervilles, you'd miss a bunch of other stuff. And Trek's the same way, right? Because you would never quite get everything that's great about it in one in one installment. And that's why it's so difficult to come up with like a top 10 list or whatever. And like, you know, um, you know, and all these things like the Beatles, right? Like where it's just like, well, what the fuck? Like all every like, you know, people are like the Beatles songs are all perfect. It's like, no, the many of the Beatles songs are deeply flawed, which is why it's so great to like unpack yeah. them. You know, I'd be like, well, why? What, well, what is the deal with with with, you know, my name, look up the number. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, why is why is the White Album recorded that way? You know, um, why are there three versions of Across the Universe? Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. I think th th these things are just really interesting. And I think that when things are just kind of like well-made and unassailable, it's less interesting to, to talk about, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I think that because Star Trek has flaws and because it was also made at a time where some of the stuff doesn't age well, you know, some well-meaning social politics mm -hmm. don't necessarily age well, you know what I mean? And then you're like, well, that's then interesting to unpack um yeah i like things like that you know what i mean that that, ha yeah. that have flaws because then then you then you have some you have something to talk about um and so i think that but i think star trek is is more self-aware than other pop culture phenomena of its own ideal of itself like yeah th like there, there's an awareness that the writers have that like people have a conception of perfect star trek and that doesn't really exist as much in other franchises, like maybe like in superhero stuff where people have a conception of what they think the perfect version of Batman is or something. And so then yeah. there's kind of a composite of that. So then the, the, the culture reflects that back, right? Then they're like, okay, well, let's reflect back on the culture, what they think Batman's about or what they think James Bond is about. And then let's subvert that or let's, and so Star Trek has that, but it's not just one character. It's like 
hundreds of characters, mm -hmm. right? Like if you just yeah, took yeah. The, the regular casts of each show, you're already at almost a hundred characters. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so then that's yeah. like, you know, so then you're like, okay, well, someone's conception of Spock can exist in like five different ways across different shows and movies and various actors at this point. Yeah. But then you're like, that's just one Star Trek character. You know, then you're like, well, what about Harry Kim? <laughs> you know, like or <laughs> Captain Janeway or Captain Archer, or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, so I think that just the sheer vastness of it and that each of those characters has biographies that are capacious enough to sort of um, warrant more thought about them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is really, really compelling. You know what I mean? Uh, Michelle Forbes coming back to play Ensign Rowe in Picard season three is actually a really good example of this. You know, mm -hmm. I was like watching I was watching some old Next Generation with my daughter. And Ensign Rose is a really powerful character for like a young girl. So then to be like, okay, well, like, right. Well, what's that character like 30 years later? Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's already interesting. And that's one tertiary character from the next generation. Yes, you know what yes. I mean? I, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't think of another franchise that can take a tertiary character from another show, bring them back 25 years later, and then give them like this emotional and like, you know, cathartic, uh, a storyline like i i just i can't just i can't think of, like what would that even what you, what could you even compare that to yeah in pop can't. culture <laughs> it's, it's really impossible sure. to think and that's just one example you know what i mean and, and star yeah. trek has multiple examples of that so i think that's what i mean is that there's just all these ways that it, that it sort of manifests itself and you're like oh that was the most emotional or philosophically interesting or most compelling moment in all of star trek and then mm -hmm. two weeks later you're like no there's another one <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. another one there's another <laughs> one you know what i mean and so i think and i think that's what you're seeing with the new shows is they keep mm -hmm. saying no there might be something more i said this to patrick stewart i was like are you done playing picard i interviewed him ahead of the new season in the fall mm -hmm. of 2022 i got to see some of picard really early season three mm. i said so this is it you know this is it you're done he's like i always feel like there's more to say and i think that's what i was trying to say in my book is i was like there yeah. is always more that Star Trek could say. And I think that that's what, that's what the book was trying to say in that line that you referenced. Yeah, for sure. And uh, like we see this with, with the interactions between Q and Picard as well, you know, like he's testing humanity, like humanity's not perfect. And we know that it's, we're not perfect, so, but we still strive for perfection we always continue to do so. The show represents that message quite a lot in uh, several of the episodes throughout all of the series. Well, and also that maybe we shouldn't try to be perfect. And I think that's the other thing that's interesting is that, is mm -hmm. that, you know, um, you know, Kirk in, in, in Star Trek five, you know, I don't want my pain taken away. I need my pain or like, yes. you know, the idea that the Borg want things to be perfect. And then data is like, that's the sign of being delusional. You can't be perfect. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And so I, I think, yeah. I think it's the, it, the, the striving for it, but not achieving it is what's so cool. Mm -hmm. right? And, and that's then realizing I, that you won't reach it, but you can still continue to try to reach it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which is, I think, I, I just think that Star Trek just does such a great job of like unpacking that time and time again mm -hmm. that there's this like really there there's this yeah we, we have this wonderful desire to be better but that we we fall short of it but that's okay <laughs> you yeah. know um mm -hmm. for sure for sure so uh yeah ryan uh do you have any upcoming projects you talked about dune um right anything else that you've got going on that people can check out and where pe can people find you <coughs> Yeah, so I mean, I um I write uh for a lot of different places. I'm an editor at Fatherly. Uh, I write about Star Trek a lot for Inverse. Um, I just did a really big um interview with Lavar Burton that's going to come out on Fatherly in a couple mm -hmm. weeks, um, right before the Picard finale. Um, so that was amazing. I got to talk to Lavar Burton for like half an hour, and we that's great. Yeah, it's the stuff that was really cool. So that'll come out as soon. Maybe mm -hmm. when this airs, um, it'll probably be out on on Fatherly, and then yeah, I'm doing a lot of Star Trek coverage for Inverse and um, Den of Geek. I still write about Star Trek for them, and other science fiction. You know, I'm going to be doing some Star Wars coverage. You know, there's lots of Star Wars shows coming out, and then yeah, I'm I'm doing. A, I just finished a big essay about James Bond for Esquire. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, another another flawed franchise, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in different ways. Um, yeah. you know, 
uh but uh yeah so i i'm I'm doing some research there and that might lead to another project but i don't know but yeah for now the dune book in, in september september 26th yeah yeah uh, we we got a spice must flow uh <laughs> yeah that's the name of the book I'm so yeah definitely gonna read that one and uh share about it and everything so uh ryan thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show i hope no all problem, the audience and loves the episode and uh they check out your work check out your books so yeah anything else you would like to add no just thank you for having me and you yeah. know everybody should read some books yeah always read <laughs> yeah all right okay cool. thank Thanks, you so Matt. much all right take it easy yeah take it easy